I'm going to go ahead and call this work session to order. Uh, it's the oh, second work session on AO 2019-142, amending the Anchorage 2040 land use plan, AO 2019-143, rezone of Poland Park. Let's go ahead and start with introductions on this side. Cameron Perez, Rydia. Dave Peterson. Austin Benedison. Thanks, Alatel. Felix Rivera. Dave Woodfield Planning. Francis McLaughlin Planning. Dean Jensen. Okay. Mr. Chair. Oh, yes, Mr. Constant, you on the phone? Yes. Okay. Um, so, for today, um, we have a couple of uh, special limitations to review. Um, one by members Quinn Davidson and Perez Verdia, and then one by members Constant, Quinn Davidson, and Perez Verdia. Uh, and then um, after reviewing these, if we have time, I think we have some folks in the audience who might have some words for us. Um, so, um, who wants to start on these two? Start. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that okay? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, we've been talking, uh, Cameron and Chris and I, about, and I think me with a lot of constituents, and probably Cameron too, about making sure that we don't see any gas stations in this location. I think that's a primary concern of my constituents, and I like to um, suggest that we add that as a special limitation. So that's the first one, and Francis helped um, prepare that. Did you want to say anything else, Chris? Okay. Can, can I ask a question about that one? Yeah, sure. sorry. Yeah. Um, so fueling stations, we talked about last time, that actually also includes electro electronic charging. Would that be something if um, something was built there that someone wanted to add an uh, electric charging station as, I don't know, can it be an accessory use? Um, or can we limit this, um, maybe in the future, maybe make a change that would um, be more specific? Uh, Mr. Chair? M Mr. Gonson? Yeah, so uh, Ms. Alito, I checked in with the department and it doesn't need to be permitted at all if it's an operation that just wants to put in a charging station that's not a, like a fueling station but just accessory to their business. So you can talk to Mr. Schutte if he's there, but yes, it is something that they can do and we can change in the future for electric. Thank you. Would you like me to explain that? Sure. Yeah, so there's a difference between a charging station for an individual vehicle and then uh, the greater use of uh, an actual uh, uh, electronic or uh, <coughs> electric vehicle charging uh, uh, like a station that we, uh, you know, actually have multiple charging stations where the intent is to go there and actually charge. Uh, the accessory would be that, hey, you're going into the store and you just want to plug in while you're in the uh, in the stall and then come out and leave. So okay. Big difference between the two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, Mr. President, no, I don't have anything to add. I think it's a, it's a, I've, I've had the same conversations with, with my, my, my constituents that, that they're concerned about having a fueling station there and, and feel like that that's not the, the right um, kind of business for that location. So we encourage your, your support at this moment. Okay. Thank you. All right, want to move on to the next one? Sure. Um, the second one came directly from a constituent who's here, actually, and um, if there are questions, I might have him speak to it. Um, it I think the, the vision for whatever this development is, I'm thinking, oh, could it be something like Rustic Goat, where you know the parking is on the side and behind, and you have a nice facade on the front. So I proposed this uh, special limitation. I will say that I spoke um, with someone else who said, well, sometimes that is is not as good design-wise for pedestrians and for bicyclists because you have a sort of wall there and then you have people biking and walking by that rather than having more space where people are parking. So I think um, I, I would love to hear from the two constituents who I have here about what they think about that um, since this came from the community. But I, likely will be introducing it. It is currently in Francis and Dave can speak to this, but is what the West Anchorage District Plan provides for. So it would just be um, solidifying that that is what would apply to this property, even if the West Anchorage District Plan were to change later. Yeah. Um, so uh, do any of uh, folks from Sand Lake want to speak to this? Yeah. I, I don't know why I brought that up. Hey, Frank. Can you identify yourself for the record? Yes, my name is Frank Rast. I'm a retired civil engineer, and I'm a neighbor to uh, 
Thank you. I'm sorry, you're not going to get picked up on the recording. If you could just stand right here. Really well, I think I'm hard of hearing because I couldn't hear half of what these people were saying either. So I'm a retired civil engineer and I've lived adjacent to the site uh, since 1998. My wife has lived adjacent to the site since 1983, so I know all these folks quite well. Uh, the only reason why I brought that up was because what I saw um, from the draft PNZ meeting and public testimony that they were going to put in limitations that strictly conformed to what Ask Inc. was Anchor District Plan said on, on page 76. And then all of a sudden I hear this file, it's all scaled back. That, that That's all gone. And so I brought this up because I thought that was specific in the West Anchor District Plan as a requirement for the site. Well, now that I see that um, they want major site plan approval to conform to the West Anchor District Plan and how it's described, I don't think that's necessary anymore because the West Anchor District specifically says what's allowable on the site. It includes access, site access, pedestrian to the adjacent zoning, and also requires the types of developments that the developers described, which is which is bakeries and, and small scale communities and things of that sort. The community has always been opposed to gas stations. And so when you say fueling stations, I would just say uh, <laughs> gasoline stations that require underground storage are prohibited because the, 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 uh, the concern in the neighborhood always has been aquifer, aquifer as aquifer land. The, the geology is very complex. And I, I think the community is, is, is concerned about two things, the, the type of traffic gas stations bring into pollution. So uh, I'm, I'm going to concede that this park can be signed behind like rustic Road. To be honest with you, ASG really doesn't say what they want to do with the site. I, my sense is they really don't know either. They just want to get the rezone done and address, address the site plan requirements when they really have some kind of idea what they're, what they're going to do. Um, and that, I haven't heard that from them. That's my sense. So, so I, I think you put in strong language that this site development for B1A conforms to the specific requirements of the West Anchor Logistic Plan so that, so that when this moves beyond, that planning and building safety have some, something to, to review, I mean, to, to, to look at when, when these things are submitted. Can Just I, a simple can ask a question, zone. Frank, Sorry? can I ask you a question? Sure. So it already would have to conform to the West Anchorage District Plan. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but uh, there's a lot of things in West Anchorage District Plan that you could say one way or the other, too. I mean, does it have to conform to, to not uh, be an attractive nuisance, you know, like like the gas station, the holiday gas station at Jewel Lake and 80th has been described as. So how, how do you how do you conform to that? Unless you put something specific in black and white in the special limitations, <laughs> you're open to anything, anything in that plan or, or zoning or anything else. That, that's my opinion. Well, that's what I was trying to do here. This is Austin Knudson. That's what I was trying to do here yeah. with the parking. So we made sure that that stayed even yeah. if the plan yeah. changed. Yeah. But I don't think it'd be appropriate to list out every single thing yeah. in the plan, and then you get these conflicts that yeah. the plan should change even for the better yeah. for the community. Yeah. So this was trying to reach a compromise right. on what seemed like something the community cares about. Right. Yeah. Do you feel it's appropriate to move forward with, the, with this special limitation? Um, I think that, that, that a good site design brings up the parking and allows for pedestrian bicycle access. Now, now this check mark that there's no economic effect, there's an economic effect in everything you put in these ordinances and special limitations. Some positive, some negative. It's very, you know, you know very subjective. Um, but I'd like to hear what the petitioner says about that special limitation. You know, if they got real strong opposition to it and they can tell why, Say why, you know, but then you know, perhaps you know, I would say it's not that important because it already this in black and white is already in the West Anchor District Plan. It just says it's encouraged. Yeah. It doesn't say it's required. Yeah. It says it's encouraged. It's a planning document. Planning documents are flexible and are, are always going to change. And Should we maybe then hear from them? Depending on what's going in, on. In a second, I have a question. I think for you, sir, from Miss Alta, um, and then I also want to note for the record we've been joined by Mr. France. I'm oh. sorry. So Just, I have a Suzanne question. is here, yeah. that's all. and I have a question um, for both you and um, the resident. Um, are we wanting the parking to be contiguous to the building site? Because when you mentioned Rustic Goat, half that parking is across the street. So I guess I'm having a hard time. Because, mm -hmm. beside, because technically that parking 
is, well, that one's across the street, but you could have parking that's beside a building or behind a building with an intervening street. So I didn't know if it needed to be contiguous or is included as part of the building site versus over, and I know that that might be a parking agreement or we might have to have a limitation on a parking agreement for a space that isn't the actual lot. This might, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah, no, you said it right. Um, Mr. Chair, may I respond? Yep. Through the chair, Ms. Delatel, that's a good question, and um, I think that the uh, the wording of the special ed limitation covers your issues. Um, we think that, I mean, so the planning department worked with uh, assembly members uh, on the wording. We think that it's good wording and that it will promote good site design. It reflects what's already in the West Anchorage District Plan. Um, I think that your issues are covered with this. Would this allow there to be um, a parking agreement for additional parking that isn't beside or behind the business? Uh, so it's residential um, across these streets. Uh, so on property, this would require parking to be behind or on the side of, of, of uh, the, the building. Um, there's, with future subdivisions, um, there's the potential for, I mean, if it was subdivided again, it would be, what you're describing would only come into play because you can't have, um, uh, you, you can't have a standalone parking lot in the B1A district, that's not allowed, okay? So it has to be a parking lot with um, a building or a use. So um, the parking for this future business um, will be all on site with this business. Now, if something sort of weird happens and like the property is few further subdivided, there would be potential for um, uh, parking agreements, there would be allowances for that, should um, there be sufficient uh, parking for that other use to have extra spaces for the first one. But then our code has spe specifics that you can't have over park sites. And so the, Title 21 sort of covers these issues. Uh, we have no concerns about this. So I'm trying to reconcile that with what happens at Rustic Go. So. Uh, excuse me, could I respond? <laughs> My understanding is Rustic Hill did meet Town 21 requirements for parking when it got approved. So, as consequently, they were short on parking. The municipality found some space nearby that was visible right away that uh, they came with some kind of agreement for off site parking. That's right. That's right. That's exactly. so I don't know how it got approved other than okay. somebody pulled some strings. And, and this shouldn't happen here. So. It sounded like Mr. Whitfield. Yeah, well. I was <clears throat> I was just going to respond to uh, the parking issue. I think that um, the language that we're, we're proposing here covers, uh, I think, the concern that you have with Belleville. I think that uh, when you establish the zoning district, uh, any development within that zoning district would be subject to these special limitations and would thus require uh, the parking to be either on the side or behind any business that would be established within that district. Okay. Okay. Um, did the landowner want to weigh in on this? Sure. Uh, Ryan Zins, uh, Anchor Sand and Gravel. Um, you, you know, we don't. Uh, Mr. Rath is actually absolutely right. We've gone through a whole lot of different uh, iterations and kind of planning uh, uh, concepts on the property, so we don't have a set design in there. The only thing that's slightly I say concerning is when we start adding limitations because I'm not sure what that really does and it's going to change. And that's why I think the uh, major site plan review would be the best vehicle for that if there is something changed that we can work within that and we're not uh, in conflict with something that happens in the future at a planning department because of the stipulation here. Uh, the, the, the gas station, that we're fine. I mean, that's something that, that we would like to give the community. We've, we've been adamant that's not our intent to put a gas station so we're, we're okay with that uh, uh, limitation. But the other one, I would, I would, uh, would prefer that we go through the major site plan review so that we can know where we're at, and if there is issues with parking, it be addressed with the planning at that time. It would be our preference. Thank you. I want to note for the record, we've been joined by Ms. Kennedy, uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was just going to say. Uh, the, the reason that we uh, changed the uh, allowed parking at Westy Go was because it got to be a public safety issue with people, people parking on both sides of the street and traffic backed up on the northern lights as they were waiting and trying to figure out where they were going to park down there. And so we allowed that parking lot across the street to be developed to try to reduce the potential for 
traffic accidents and injuries. Thank you. I, I think I'm the only one left on the body that was involved. <laughs> We're <laughs> out too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any other? Uh, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Yeah, I just would like for the members of the public that are there uh, from the neighborhood for the planning department to describe briefly what major site plan review means. I read some emails from members of the neighborhood who seemed to believe that that was simply an administrative process. No, it's a public hearing site plan review so the applicant has to have a community meeting um, with the community council and then um, uh, and they have to notice that meeting uh, before they even make application. When they make application, it goes up on our website. They post uh, public hearing notice signs at the property. Um, it's approximately two months until uh, um, a time until there's a, uh, a public hearing. Um, everyone uh, from the public has an opportunity to provide written comments on the application and to uh, uh, testify um, in person at the meeting um, and express whatever concerns uh, they might have. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Prince. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Apologies for being late. You've probably covered the questions I have, but just looking at the amendments in the two um, letter A's, and I guess this would be a question for Ms. Quinn Davidson and Mr. Perez Verdia. They vary just slightly. You are in favor of either of those passing. I know the one for amendment number one says unless a higher level of review is required, but uh, the A on amendment two doesn't have that language. Yes, Francis to respond because he drafted that language. We had some discussion about it. It was the, the intent of at least what made it into amendment number one was to not limit us if mm -hmm. there were even better requirements for the community at a later date. But I don't, do you think that should also be in the amendment number two? Yeah, is that I what mean, you're suggesting, Suzanne? What, what I'd envision, because, you know, different floor amendments, what I'd envision is ultimately the assembly will probably seek to um, approve um, uh, all of this change language, everything underlined to go in. So, uh, ah, for so floor one would already cover one, it. Got it. Yeah, so it's just yeah. all the underlying language to go in. I was trying not to make it complicated, duplicative. Okay. I see. So on amendment number, if I may. Yeah. Um, amendment number two is only adding the underlined section. Yeah. Because I didn't want to be repetitive and okay. have the stuff that floor amendment yeah, one, just then it gets confusing. That's what I thought. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. And may I follow up with another question? And I remember from last time the discussion of fueling stations. It was noted that fueling stations for electric cars then would also be prohibited, and that is the case. Yeah. Okay. So then Not individual to... stations, so may guess that question would be covered. Okay. If, just if the cover. business added it as a use or an amenity with just the business, that would be okay. 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 Thanks for um, repeating that for me. Any other questions from the members on these two before I turn it over to folks in the audience? Okay. All right. Um, does anyone in the audience want to speak on these two? Sure. Right. Just a small detail. I'm Tom Jarvis, board who represent the ASG. On A, it has track two and three uh, required to meet the intent of small scale commercial. It's just a detail that the, the small scale commercial will be on track three. The track two is the R2M. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so can I? Can I jump in and we'll yes. have a discussion about it? Okay, sure. so uh, so ASG's representative, Tom Dreyer, is saying that obtaining major site plan review approval uh, for tracks two and three to demonstrate um, a site plan and design intent, meaning a description of small scale commercial in the West Anchorage District Plan. Um, so his comment is well, uh, track three shouldn't be, um, or track two should not be in that list because that's residential R2M development, has nothing to do with small-scale commercial. Um, his comment is fine. Um, that is uh, a point that um, could be made or a clarification. Um, what this language is, is uh, uh, exactly out of the minutes and the resolution that the Planning and Zoning Commission passed. So it appeared that, that the commission, and I think they had a finding about this, they wanted um, to see a major site plan review for both tracks, not just one. 
So I think that it works um, with either the way it's written now or the way that Mr. Dreher uh, proposes. Um, but the difference is, is that um, if you leave both tracks in, what you get is major site plan review of both tracks. If you delete um, track two, that's the residential larger eight, eight acre track, then you don't get a major site plan review of that residential development. Now it probably would get residential, it would probably get a major site plan review anyway because our Title 21 already requires multiple structures um, to go through uh, that site planning process. Um, yeah, I guess one only point was that uh -huh. to not apply small scale commercial attractions. So it's fine having the major site plan approved for track two and three, yeah. but only. Uh, I think that's understood. Sure. Yeah, you okay. couldn't apply the design requirements in, in the West Anchorage District Plan for commercial development to a residential development. Yeah, yeah, but that's, yeah. yeah. Is, it was that more of your, your thing? You just don't want small scale commercial uh, design requirements to be applied to the residential development. Yeah, they won't. Correct. They won't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, welcome. Good morning. My name is Krista Scully. I live at 5410 West Diamond Boulevard in the Seacliff Condo Association, which is directly across the street from the proposed development. Um, if this is an appropriate time to talk about the expectations around a major site map development plan, I'd like to address that. Uh, as a community member, this is my first time participating in a planning and zoning um, process, and I have to say that it has been really disheartening. Um, you basically have to make this your part-time job in order to become essentially a land use expert to really understand this as a process. I've had a lot of help because I know how to ask for help. I'm very concerned by this process for this community for a number of reasons. Um, one, the Community Council for Sand Lake has been understandably overwhelmed and focused on the earthquake issues. Not a lot of time has been able to be devoted to this issue. Um, when there has been an opportunity for the petitioner to come before the Community Council, at least one of the meetings I came to, the presentation was um, the extent of which was about an eight and a half by 14 piece of paper mounted to a piece of foam core that nobody could see, nobody could understand. Um, and I think that there is a general deep mistrust of the petitioners, um, simply because information hasn't been shared, there's been some evasiveness, and I think that it would go a long way to engage the community in more productive and thoughtful ways. Um, one of which is, like, we get these notices, I don't know what these mean, I had to do a significant amount of research to figure out like, oh, there is a master plan. Where do I find that? It's available on the internet or for purchase. Uh, I thought well, maybe I could check it out from the library. It's not at the library. Um, it's text dense. It uses a lot of jargon. Um, and I'm an educated person, but I think about all of the community members that would look at this and have no idea how to proceed. I haven't seen anything that's in other kinds of languages. I haven't seen any sort of um, imagery, and part of that is is what makes the community anxious, is because it feels like this has been a removing target. So, I mean, you're here today to talk about special limitations, and I appreciate that. It sounds like there's a vision for a rustic, go a rustic goat type situation, but we don't know that. We haven't heard that from the petitioners. Um, so I think that if there was thoughtful and intentional process with the community, this would go a lot smoother. I think that people would feel much more invested in what happens as opposed to coming at it with fearful and angry energy, which is really the place I've been at because it's been hard to navigate this. Um, I appreciate the assembly. I, I know that you're digging deep on these issues and we appreciate that, but moving forward, I would like to see I know you think a major site um, approval plan has a format, and I want to invite you to think about expanding that and how you really engage people. We got postcards for a barbecue, but nobody knew <laughs> nobody knew what that was this summer. So, um, you know, I don't know if you have resources about how you devote more time and energy to engaging the community, but I would ask for that. Um, 
And in terms of parking, I'm alarmed by that because originally we thought this was going to be a residential neighborhood. Now there's going to be a business. Now there's going to be additional parking for even more people coming in and out of the neighborhood. And, and so I just really ask you to be um, thoughtful about the public process. You've seen hundreds of comments from people in the neighborhood. When we showed up for planning and zoning, staff had already been made aware that the community was really concerned about this. So I, I would like you to really take heed as to what people are saying um, in this process. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. LaFranson and Mr. Costin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, um, the question for you, thank you for coming and, and for your comments and your feedback about the process. I think that um, if you've got some specific suggestions, like you mentioned today, if you wouldn't mind emailing us them, I mean, maybe for the CEC committee discussion. Yes. And then I wanted to ask, is there any specific information that you want from the developer that you feel like you haven't received, I mean, specifically at, at this point? Um, I mean, at this point, I think I would have had different questions before. When I bought my property now 10 years ago, I was told that parcel of land was slated for soccer fields, which is part of the reason why I bought in that neighborhood, because I thought, oh, that would be undeveloped. Um, I guess the train is less the station. There was uh, the community believed that. So I'm sorry, that's not a really direct way to answer your question. I'd like to think about it a little bit more, sure. but I definitely will have questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Constant? I just wanted to say hi to Krista and Ms. Scully and say thank you for showing up. It's super important and valuable that you did. Thank you. Yes. Hey, thank you for allowing me to come up a second time. Again, my name is Frank Rask. I'm a retired engineer. And one thing I want to say about the process, it's very convoluted. Uh, the developer had to run through a number of different jumps and hoops and steps. Some of them required public notice, some, some didn't. I would say I talked to Tom. I, I thought a better approach would be to maybe have come up with some kind of simple flow chart that can show you know, where they're at because they come to these meetings with a presentation that gets conflated with other things that were in the process on a hoop they'd already jumped through. And so some people come late in the process in the community, some people come early, they miss a meeting. The, the community council itself has been in turmoil since the earthquake because we had a change in president we had people coming in temporary they didn't know what was going on that's no excuse but i'm just saying the process can be very common people don't understand the process uh, the postings all have a website that you can go to i don't think people really understand the, how the portal works and i think there's maybe a little, a little more public communication to the councils on the portal that people can look at and see where we're at and what's going on in the community council. That way a lot of the questions may be answered even before they come to these meetings. And every is pretty tech now, so I just don't think a lot of people in the community councils are aware of this portal and how to get the information. The only comment I have on the process is a lot of times staff comments don't come out until four days or five days before the approval meeting. And, they, and then the community council doesn't have a chance to wait on staff comments. Their only recourse is to go to the actual P and Z meeting, and, and that of course ties up people. Or meetings like this is because a lot of these things, the staff comments weren't vetted at a community council meeting, and, and that, I don't know how that can change the process. Planning is always over, overwhelmed. That the, the commissioners always like the process to move quickly because time is money to everybody. And I don't know what, what if anything had changed other than a little bit more public information the community councils, you know, maybe a little more outreach from planning. There was some confusion last year in, in our community council when, when I said, you know, people really don't understand the 2040 plan and how it relates to Sand Lake. So planning sent somebody and she talked about the 2040 plan and all these things and people were expecting something specific to the community council. So there's been a lot of miscommunication through this whole process, and I, I don't really know how it can be improved uh, because it sure seems like people all spend a lot of extra time on, on things just because of a lack of some basic understanding. And, and both at the community council level, particularly, because we've had so much turnout. So, uh, but thanks again for the opportunity to Can I ask uh, or just make a comment that I think relates to what Frank is saying? What I've noticed about rezones in general is that the 
the muni doesn't really, this muni planning staff doesn't really get involved at the beginning, right? You're involved at the end, right before it's gonna go to planning and zoning, you make a recommendation. So right. these folks are there, you know, in this case, ASG are there to talk about the project, but they're not the experts that you are. And so they're there talking about their project, but the community might ask land use questions, but they don't necessarily know, nor is it their job to fully understand that. So then, but then, so there's like months of that and where everyone's kind of like, what's going on? And then at the end, you guys show up right before PNZ and say, this is our recommendation. And then everyone's confused and it happens quickly. So I think their comments, both of them in that respect are totally accurate. And I wonder if it's possible and it's a staffing thing and it's a cost thing, I'm sure. Um, but to have the Muni staff more engaged from the beginning on rezone petitions so that the public gets a better sense of what's actually going on. Uh, to the chair, uh, Dave Whitfield, Planning Department. If I can just respond to that. Um, first of all, thank you both for your comments. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're always looking for opportunities to improve our process, uh, improve our, our community engagement. Um, but you're, you're right. Um, we don't typically take uh, an active role at the beginning of a, of a case simply because we're trying to remain impartial. And if we haven't had the opportunity to review the documents that have come in from the, uh, from the petitioner, um, we can't uh, approach the community council and, and give them an indication as to how we might uh, uh, see a particular case. So we try to remain impartial until we've had the opportunity to review uh, the documents and make a recommendation to uh, both the Planning and Zoning Commission and to the Assembly. Would it, can I follow up, Mr. Chair? Would it be possible, though, not to make a recommendation, but say, um, you know, a month before PNZ or many months before, but where you're familiar with the, the petition because it's been submitted, you come and just talk about what that means and what's a major site plan and if it's required, right. this is what would happen right. or this is the current zoning because I think that gets a little mixed up at the community council meetings. Yeah, I know. Um, we get uh, on occasion uh, requests from community councils to come and, and present to them, uh, not just on rezones, but generally speaking on, on all things mm -hmm. planning. Uh, and where we have uh, uh, the resources to do so, we absolutely will. Uh, so maybe that's a message too, is getting the community council early on to pass resolutions that say, we wanna have someone from planning come and talk to us about this. Uh, planning is really stretched thin, and the resources are really to come to the meetings, especially at night when we really fix them. My suggestion is invite the community council to the pre-application meeting, and, and then they'll see right up front you know, what's going on? Well, my concern is there has been a lot of transparency, and I've been seeing pre-application meetings. I know exactly what happens. The developers lobby planning to cut corners and, and, and to squeeze stuff in. And I think if you really want to get the community councils involved in, in the community, what's going on in the community, invite the community councils to pre-application meetings. And they can choose to attend if they want to. Thank you. I'm not sure why uh, that can't I'll happen. I'll let you respond in a minute. I have to move on. So. Um, want to note that we've been joined by Mr. Weddleton, Ms. Salatel. Um, thank you. Um, along this vein, I think a lot of folks don't understand what the um, proposed uses might be in the, in the proposed zoning um, change. So the idea I'm going to toss out as we have this conversation, because it happened in some other rezones, is one, um, to be really clear that when you're proposing a rezone or the applicant's proposing a rezone, they don't have to tell you what they're going to do with it, but you do need to know what would be allowed there. Is that perhaps a handout that says, B1A allows these with, you know, right out of the, the handbook, the chart, um, and then like a little glossary of conditional use site plan, you know, just a few glossary terms so that the applicant can pick that up when they apply and they can like have that to hand out at the meetings because I think folks don't know what goes into each zoning district. Um, I spend a lot of time with the land use um, categories but a lot of folks don't and they are hard to find so I think that actually would go a long way to empowering residents um, and maybe some kind of informational same kind of like easy direction when you get that green card because I think that's the big thing I think we have to demystify what the potential zoning might be and it, zoning is hard yeah I mean that's a good comment um, Ms. Selatel, uh, I view my role as uh, uh, 
providing accurate uh, information and helping explain things uh, to the public in the simplest way possible. And I think I'm really good at it. Um, the uh, posters that are posted at the property have the planning department's phone number on them um, and the case number. The mailers that, that go out um, have uh, the planning department's phone number on there. Um, community council presidents and boards and individual members of the public regularly call us and email us and um, I provide all the information and transparency that I could possibly provide and because uh, I've lived here a long time and worked on a lot of projects I have you know whole neighborhoods and subdivisions memorized and I can speak off the cuff about um, what I know about the property and what possibilities there are and um, so that is to say that you know with the first speaker um, yeah, it would be really hard for uh, you know a homeowner to um, know that the property owner is proposing to rezone the property, this comp plan amendment, and then will come with a conditional use amendment sometime in the future. That would be really confusing. So the mailer that they received and the sign that's posted the property says, you know, call the planning department three four three seven nine four three, and if you call, we'll pick it up on the first ring and. Um, go beyond answering your questions and explaining things and tell you everything that we can to help you feel comfortable understanding what's going on. Um, and if, uh, the, uh, uh, if a future applicant has this community meeting before the planning department has even gotten involved, they can still, I mean, you know, Frank here is what he said is true and that, but he regularly emails and calls us and I try and answer what I can. Um, He's really sort of up on this stuff. So, but but uh, you know, we will um, you know answer questions and um, cut through and explain things. And I just think that uh, um, that has to be said. Um, well, I would say Francis has been very responsive to me over the last ten years. But Thank you. that doesn't detract from the fact that the uh, community councils often uh, get involved in the process after a lot of things have been agreed to, between planning and uh, petitioner. And I. I really think that the community council, and I'm not sure if it's an order or some requirement, why a community council can't be invited to a pre-application meeting, but you know, maybe I'm missing something here. Well, it sounds like you can. Sorry, well, you won't know about it. No, no. Mr. Chair, the, 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 the the Oh, not to the pre, I'm sorry, yeah. to the community council meeting prior to the right. PNC stuff. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Actually, all of my questions um, were addressed, but I just want to take a moment to thank both of you for coming. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would just stand up on behalf of the planning department here. I heard the speaker suggest that the planning department is making backdoor deals with developers. In the end, what's happening there is the developers are coming in for their property right interest, coming and asking the question, what can we do? How should we do this? I don't personally believe that's a place for community council input. And I think that the community councils are the place where I see the most manipulation happen. I support the community council system, but I don't believe that those parties have an interest until such a time as there's an application laid on the table. Thank you. Um, any other comments from affected parties? Uh, sure, one, one more for me. I, I just want to respond to Mr. Constant that I did mean to in, 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 in tone that people are cutting backroom deals. I've never seen that happen anywhere. What I have seen, though, is petitioners come in, I've been to these meetings, and ask what changes can we make to the zoning to accommodate changes in the community since these plans were issued. That's not a backroom deal. That's not what I commentated. So uh, respectfully, I, I just hope that you understand that was not my intent and what I said. I've never heard of that happening in, in Anchorage, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments from the members? All right, thanks, everyone.